welcome. We are few in number in the sanctuary, but we are going to make a joyful noise anyway. If you're joining us online, please bring your own Christ candle and we'll light them together. In the bulletin, responses in bold are spoken in unison. And when there is an asterisk, asterisk, please stand if you're able. Announcements. Greta has an announcement. We are now officially a Matthew 25 church. We submitted the information, Presbyterian uh, missions accepted, so we are now official, and Andy is going to show a brief video about kind of what that means. If you have any other questions, please get with me during brunch, and I'm happy to answer them. So, you are now a Matthew 25 church. Welcome to this exciting movement that's transforming the church and the world. Remember, the Matthew 25 movement isn't one size fits all. Plant a community garden. Advocate for affordable housing. Celebrate Matthew 25 in worship. Promote equal education in your community. Host an addiction recovery group. You choose what fits best with your congregation. Keep growing and learning and trying new things, knowing that the God of hope is with you. So, you are now in Matthew 25. So, you are... So, a lot of what goes into that, we've already been doing for ever. So, so you are now... In Do you want to talk about uh, the brunch meetings? Good morning. We are small but mighty. It might have something to do with all the schools getting started soon. Um, next week is our second big meeting brunch. So the committees that met will meet again. So if you promise to do something, for your committee, this is the week to make sure it gets done before your committee meets again. So those committees are worship, care of family, soon to have a new name, and um, neighborhood and hospitality, building and grounds and fellowship. So those are the ones to dive into. Um, so that'll be at brunch next week. Thank you. And uh, you're not committing yourself when you go and sit at a table. One of the things we want everybody to do is to know what the committees do and then to be able to choose which ones to work with. My other announcement is that, um, as I told you last week, on August the 13th, second Sunday in August, um, our Sunday worship will move from Zoom to Facebook Live. And you don't have to have a, a Facebook account to uh, sign in. You just click the worship link that's going to be in the newsletter, and it will take you to Southminster's Facebook page. No more clicks. You just wait till 10 o'clock and the worship starts. Other announcements? I wanted to let everyone know next week is where, how I got here with our children. And so we will celebrate the kids, bring their backpacks for school, they will be blessed, and uh, we'll just get to know those kids a little bit more in our congregation because they are our children of God. The next Sunday is the first Sunday, so it will be communion, right? Yes. Okay, yes.
The Lord be with you. <laughs> so when Bethany and I got together, we get together periodically now, um, Anissa has been joining us. We were like, what can we do this summer? The narrative lectionary doesn't have anything during the summers, so that gives us a chance to do creative things. So we came up with the How I Got Here series, and we came up with um, another one that we're gonna do in a couple weeks called Why We Do What We Do When We Do It in Worship. And we had this idea of a spontaneous sermon Sunday, which seemed like such a good idea at the time. <laughs> And now I'm like, what was I thinking? Um, here's how it'll work. You have Bibles in your pews. You get to randomly, Andy, randomly open, read whatever little chunk is there with the subheadings, and I'll see what I can come up with. And we'll see what God does with that. Again, this seemed like such a good idea at the time. <laughs> um, also, I grabbed my wrong piece of paper, so while you all sing the first hymn, I'm going to run and get the right piece of paper. So, let's worship together. Join me for the call to worship and opening prayer. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. O oh God, you are the gathering one who gathers us into community with each other to love and work, to support and heal. You are the gathering one who calls us into community with all people to bring justice and hope freedom and truth. You are the gathering one who calls us into community with the whole creation to live in harmony, to cherish and renew. Let us worship the God who makes us one. Amen. Please stand for the hymn. standing for the prayer of confession and assurance of forgiveness. 
The kingdom of heaven is for all of us, but we come to this space full of our own burdens. Let us confess our sins before our triune God. Holy, Holy God, God, we try, we try to, to keep, keep you close to us, but in, in the, the process, we push our neighbors away. We have been distracted in a distracting world and withheld love from each other and from you. Have mercy on us, O God. In your compassion, cleanse and release us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Amen. Who is to condemn? It is Christ who died and who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Eternal God, you have made us in your image. Let our hearts, minds, and spirits be turned to you in this time so that the Holy Spirit may bring us closer to the word. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is the whole Psalm 150. I'm reading from the Common English Bible. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his fortress, the sky. Praise God in his mighty acts. Praise God as suits his incredible greatness. Praise God with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise God with lute and the lyre. Praise God with drum and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with loud cymbals. Praise God with clashing cymbals. Let everything praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think he gave us some uh, indication of other instruments we might try, musical instruments. <laughs> Please feel free to sing along with us on this anthem, especially on the chorus. Worship is so 
to invite Air. Oh, wait a minute. Let me check. I have a message from Kiana. Okay, she says she's having car issues. No fun. But the kids can just stay with us, can't they? Until they get here. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Eli. Do you guys know what the word impossible means? Anybody? Anybody? Let me know. Impossible, what does it mean? It can't be done. That's, that's what we think of. So, we're going to try some impossible things. Pardon? I'm not Kathy Todd. Okay. Maybe. Let's try some impossible things, okay? Put your hands in your lap. And leave your hands in your lap, but wave your fingers in the air. Uh, but your hands aren't in your lap. It's impossible, right? Okay, now let's look at that wall with our left eye and at that wall with our right eye. Can't do it, can we? Because our eyes are trained to kind of go together. They're a team, right? Now, I have another question for you. Um, do you think, is it possible for God to skip church? What do you think? Can God just skip church if God wants to? Because God can do anything? Well, I'll tell you what. God made a promise. God said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm going to be there. And... God keeps God's promises. Yay. So we know that even though there aren't very many of us here, God will keep God's promise. And God is here with us. So when we have a call to worship, Aaron, do you know what? It's my turn to talk. OK. Um, when we have a call to worship, are we asking God to be here? No, God's already here. What we're doing is helping us be aware of God. So let's say a prayer. Aaron, keep your feet on the, on the step, please. Thank you. Dear God, Dear God we, love we love to worship you because you are wonderful. Thank you for always being with us when we worship. We know that no matter where we are, you've promised to be with us. Amen. All right, guys, if you want to go sit. Oh, okay. Miss Katie is going to go with you guys until Miss Kiana and Miss Katrina get here. Okay. Here we go. So here's how this is going to work. Bethany is going to randomly choose someone to randomly pick a scripture. And so you are, you can open your Bible anywhere and we're going to see what happens. And um, she's going to bring you the microphone so you can read it unless you tell me where it is and I'll read it and we're going to use the um, NRSB today because that is what we have in the pews. All right. Random. Randomly. Just pick it. Randomly. And just open it randomly and you can... Emily! Emily! Okay. <laughs> Emily. Oh, gosh. Again, this seemed like such a good idea. Oh, I have to read it. Yeah, this tell me where on, it is. Well, this is on page 588. Okay. It's Proverbs 5, 1. My child, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. Got you a good one, didn't I? Okay, yeah. 585. My, this, um, this Bible is upside down, so it took me a minute. <laughs> 
Okay, 585. So, 588, thank you. Are you going to read it upside down? Maybe. Spontaneous Sunday, we're going to read upside down and backwards. All right, my child, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. So this comes from, let's orient ourselves first in the scripture. This, this comes from what, is, what are known as the wisdom writings, or our Jewish brothers and sisters call these just the writings. And usually we attribute a lot of the wisdom statements to Solomon, who was, fascinatingly, a child born to David and Bathsheba, which got a rocky start, to say the least. And so Solomon asked um, God, well, God said to Solomon, ask me for anything. And Solomon asked God for wisdom. And God said, you didn't ask me for long life. You didn't ask me for riches. You asked me for wisdom, and so I will give you all three. So when he is saying, my child, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, what I take from that is that we have a responsibility to listen to wisdom. It doesn't, we, we, we aren't just gonna like randomly have it pop up. It, it involves, you know, to incline your ear. It means to make an effort to go find wisdom. And it goes on down, it says, so you can hold on to prudence and your lips may guard knowledge, etc., etc. All right, that's one. Any questions? We can also have questions. Nope. Oh, <laughs> thank you. All right. Miranda if again. If you want to do something, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's looking at me. Okay. Uh, well, it's going to have to be super, super. Um, <laughs> Greta. <laughs> That's right, you have to go home with me. Nobody else wants to <laughs> All right. So, random. Oh, good deal. <laughs> yeah. Great. Page 105. Of the New Testament, I'm guessing. Of the New Testament. I'm looking at where your Bible is. Luke 22. 25, yeah, 22, verse 14. And you can read like the whole sub okay. heading, you know, if that's, if that works better for you. Sure. You're the one having to preach on it, so I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> when the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I, tell, <clears throat> excuse me, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. You can go on to the okay. next. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, the cup, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. But see, the one who be betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. Well, there's a lot there, and I'm sure those verses are very familiar um, to you. So he's saying um, he's eagerly desired to eat this Passover. So for his whole life, Jesus, being a good Jew, had been traveling to Jerusalem, with the exception of the time they were in Egypt, um, traveling to Jerusalem to eat the Passover. The Passover is the meal that Jews eat to celebrate their emancipation from slavery in Egypt when um, 
the, God told them to put lamb's blood on the door and um, anyone who did not have the lamb's blood on the door, the firstborn would die. And so they are celebrating the passing over of them. And that was what finally convinced Pharaoh to let them go. So it's a very, if any of you have participated in, it's called a Seder meal. And if any of you have ever participated in one, it's, it's really fascinating. Everything is very symbolic. And so Jesus had already eaten two Passovers at least um, with the disciples. This is the third and final one. So they're in Jerusalem. It's Thursday of Holy Week as we look at it. And he's saying to them, this is really important. Before I suffer, and they probably were like, why are you going to suffer? What does that mean? And they were probably, to be honest, saying, does that mean I'm going to suffer? What does that mean? And so Jesus does what we're so familiar with. He breaks bread and he gives it to them and says, do this in remembrance of me. He gives them the cup and says, this is the covenant poured out in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And that, that right there might have tipped them off. Something very strange is happening. Um, because passing around bread, doing it in remembrance of Jesus, they're probably, that might have fit somehow. But saying, this represents my blood, that's pretty huge. And so they may have been going, what is going to happen? And being very anxious and afraid for him and afraid for themselves. And what I think is really important to look at here is, um, you know, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. We all know that that's Judas who sometimes I think Judas was just trying to speed things up and get Jesus to do what, he, what Judas thought he should do and have a military coup and overthrow the Roman Empire. And so by, going, by forcing his hand, he maybe thought he could get things to move along. But that wasn't the um, victory that Jesus was aiming for. The victory Jesus was aiming for was the resurrection. And so what I think is fascinating is that Jesus ate that last Okay. He ate that last Passover meal with with Judas. And there's nothing in here that indicates that Judas was any less welcome than any of the other disciples. And that is a level of love and um, welcome that we all get. So if you think that you wouldn't have been welcome at that table and you're not welcome at Christ's table here, think again, because God's welcome is that wide. All right. Oh, yes, yes, we can do a question. Love questions. Oh, okay. All right. Well... <laughs> All right, so my question, this is something I've always kind of wondered about. So Judas gets a bad rap, right? And, I mean, you know, obviously he's the guy who betrays Jesus. And, but, like, without that betrayal, we wouldn't have the cross and we wouldn't have the resurrection. So how are we supposed to continue to think of him as a bad guy? Or are we supposed to think of him as a bad guy? I think, I think we would have still had the cross and the resurrection, the story might have had some different details. Okay. Because Jesus was heading there anyway. Um, you know, they, the only thing that Judas did was when the soldiers came for Jesus, he went and kissed Jesus on the cheek to show which one Jesus was. So he, he didn't force the cross, he just facilitated the cross. Does that answer your question? And so in my mind, we can think of, you know, we, I think we all grow up as kids, you know, being mad at Judas and being like, you know, he's the bad guy. But I hope that as we mature and as we look at our own realities and our own capacity for betrayal and for letting friends and loved ones down, that we can say, yeah, I got a little of Judas in me too. And thanks be to God, God's grace is big enough for that too. That answer your question. Oh, Mark has a question. Uh oh. 
and you can do the next verse. <laughs> this, is, this is the preacher's son. Okay, lay it on me. So verse 20 talks about a new covenant. Why do we need a new covenant? Mm. Um, this one is, is hard to answer because I was raised in a supersessionist mindset, and supersessionist means that God has undone what happened with the Jew, Jewish people and replaced it, superseded it with Christianity. I no longer believe that. I think that God, it's a thing of progressive revelation where, yes, we had a new covenant, but it doesn't undo God's faithfulness and God's love for the Jewish people. I look at it as like we then get invited to the party too, all of us Gentiles. Does that answer your question a little bit? I know there's, that may, probably makes 45 more questions, but we can talk on the plane tomorrow. <laughs> all right, questions or scriptures? All righty. Oh. oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I opened to Mark 13, or, uh, chapter 12, verse 13. It's a parable, a question about paying taxes. <laughs> There's no irony there. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came to him and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. All right, thank I, I love that one. That's, um, so first, there's so many things that come to my head here. First, it's kind of obvious that he's saying, well, yeah, pay your taxes. But what we forget is they also had to pay a temple tax, and it had to be paid in Jewish currency. And so that's where we get the money changers that, that Jesus is so angry about later, that he goes in um, and they have to change their money and pay their temple tax. So the taxing is not new. What they were trying to do was get him to be sort of an insurrectionist in a way, to say, no, you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar, which would not have gone well for them at all. But the other thing that I think is, um, that comes to mind is that we forget that our way of doing church is not that old. In the, I think it was the early 1800s, the church in America stopped receiving funds from the government. Up until then, it was supported largely by the government, and so they had to scramble. And so there were church taxes, there were membership dues, there were pew rentals, we've all heard about those. The idea of passing a plate and um, all of us, you know, a stewardship campaign, that's fairly recent. And so when we look at, I've in one of my conversations as we looked at the possibility of having revenue come in from other sources, um, somebody said to me, well, you know, passing the plate was new once too. And that made me go looking for when did that start? And it, it's not that old when you compare it to the 2,000 year history of the church, um, which makes me say, okay, then we can do some things some new ways. Is that any questions? Okay, either I'm confusing you so thoroughly or, 
All right, we'll take a few more here. Oh. I always bring my glasses, but I thought, I can see the big screen without glasses. I'm I can't so read sorry, this Debbie. without glasses. Okay. <laughs> but I will try. Okay. I will so try. I turn to, oh, thank you, Paul. Now this is, hey, this is, this is community yeah. right here, <laughs> sharing readers. <laughs> readers are good. Well, I was going to try. <laughs> Ecclesiastes, this is on page 616. And I actually like, after I started reading, I started going all the way through chapter five, but this is in four where I turned first, the value of a friend. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toll. For if they fall, one will lift up the other, but woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together and they keep warm, how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better is a poor but wise youth man than an old but foolish king who will no longer take advice. One can indeed come out of prison to reign even though the poor, the born poor in the king, even though the born poor in the kingdom, I'm sorry. I saw all the living who moving about under the sun follow that youth who replaced the king. There was no end to all those people whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this is vanity and a chasing after wind. Okay, Ecclesiastes um, is sometimes attributed to King Solomon, not always. Um, and it's again a, a wisdom writing. So you're getting kind of sometimes pithy sayings, sometimes really longer passages like this that say, here's something worth paying attention to. And I think as we look at the value of a friend, starting in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up the other. Woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. And it's, so it's saying it's just the value of community. It's a little like Paul loaning Kathy his reading glasses. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I think if you have been a part of a church community, a church family, or any kind of healthy, positive friend group when you've gone through a crisis and that family has come around you in some way and, you know, held you up when you didn't have the strength to be held up. You understand this verse very well. Um, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's very often used in weddings to be the bride, the groom, and God. I'm not sure that that might be an over-interpretation of that, but it's also true that a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And then the last part, I love this, better is a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who will no longer take advice. Well, ain't that the truth? You know, there's some, some of this stuff is like, yes, <laughs> what they said. Um, you know, and then the last part is yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. In other words, the good guy is going to be forgotten. This is vanity and a chasing after the wind. And, that is repeated, that phrase is repeated and repeated in Ecclesiastes of vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty grim outlook sometimes, pretty bleak in Ecclesiastes. And, and he basically comes to the conclusion of just do your best, your, live your life as best you can. Um, we, on this side of the cross and the tomb, say, our lives matter because what we do matters to the kingdom of God. What we do matters long after we know anything about it. Our names may not be remembered, but our faithfulness, our love, our generosity, our kindness, they matter for the kingdom of God in God's economy. What we do matters. Whereas the writer of Ecclesiastes might have said, eh, it's all a wash. But I prefer to take the stance that what we do matters. Questions? Judy. 
We need a microphone for Judy to answer a question. There. Oh. <laughs> Kathy, I appreciate that reading that you came upon. I have often thought, what do people do that don't have a church family? Uh, I treasure my church family friends and my outside of church family friends, but I was reminded of the Sunday when uh, Jamie and... Andy? No. No. Amber, Amber. <laughs> yes, thank Wrong you. <laughs> We're talking about Amber's health scare that they had, and both of them said they were so grateful that they had a church family that they knew that they could turn to and would be supportive of them in whatever was going on. Mm -hmm. And there's just nothing like having that family that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When, I, um, when we had Grace, the first time a meal showed up, I was I was just dumbfounded. At, you know, I, I didn't know this was a thing that people would bring you meals. And invariably, it was when I was so I'd forgotten to eat. I was so hungry. I was shaking, and someone would show up with a meal. And I was, you know, therefore, whenever anybody wanted a meal for another new new parent, set of new parents, it was like, yes, sign me up, because I know the value of that. So just thinking about this a little bit further, um, I, you know, so I recently took on chairing the, the Care of Families um, Committee, which is again? Care of Families. I oh, recently yeah, yeah, yeah. took on taking, this feels weird, I don't yeah. um, <laughs> took on, you know, chairing the, the Care of Families Committee, but something I've been thinking about is uh, what is the definition of a family? Mm. And, you know, and I've been thinking about church family, but then I'm also thinking about what about the families of church family, right? And it's like, where does our care stop? And I don't really know where my committee ends and where neighborhood engagement begins or like, you know, where, but like, let's say a member of my chosen family gets sick. Is it the church's responsibility to help that person? Like, where does the outreach end? And these are the kinds of questions that I'm asking about care of families, but I do just, just to say that like, yeah, how, how far do we extend family? Um, and I know that we are small, we are mighty, but we are small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that, you know, we can't, we can't necessarily reach everybody, but can, do we have room to expand the definition of families of our church? I think that's a great question. If I can comment, yesterday, um, I want to give a shout out to Jen and Rick and Anissa and Susan, who all came to um, help with the funeral of a person they'd never met. Stephanie, one of our, Stephanie our child care director, um, one of her very best friends, died suddenly at the age of 58. To my knowledge, they still don't know, don't have a cause of death. And Stephanie came to me and said, her kids, who are all, you know, probably mid-twenties on down 21-ish, they don't have a church family. Would you do the funeral? And I said, of course I will. And so to me, that was an extension of our church family because we gave them... A, a closure and we came around them and loved them for that little bit of time. They may come back to our church, they may not, but they had a need in that moment and the right thing to do was to step up. You know, I'm guessing that Rick and Jen and Anissa and Susan would all say it was just a couple hours. Because I asked Rick, I said, Rick, will you come do what Rick does? Will you just come be Rick? And he said, yes, I will. <laughs> um, but for that family, it was huge. It was a huge thing to give a dignified, beautiful, loving funeral for their mom. So. Amber, I think that we already do what you were questioning, and I realized that in taking down prayer requests, 
that very often they are family members of our members. And we may, we may know about them, but, but at the very least, or not at the very least, on the front end, we can always pray for them. It may not be a meal, um, it may not be a visit, but we can certainly pray for, the, for our extended family. I think another way that what we do makes a difference is that, uh, as you were saying, Beth, um, the fact that you received a meal when your child was born uh, makes you more willing to do that and aware that that could be done and how much help it is. Mm -hmm. And I think when we help people, then they are more likely to help somebody else, mm -hmm. and that person is more likely to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, goes back to the value of a friend, that if one falls down, as Kathy read to us, you know, the other can help them up. So let's do one more and then we'll move on. Oh, question, yes ma'am. Yeah. or maybe more of a comment. Um, I think getting back to what you're saying is with us now becoming a Matthew 25 church, even though I believe that the church was doing it anyway, we are showing that everyone is our church family. The entire world is our church family because we are conscious, and Beth talks about it and includes it in prayers, you know, the poor, people who are oppressed because of their race or whom they fall in love with. It's just something that is inherent in this church, not, and hopefully a lot of churches, but it's not universal. So I think that we do it that way um, because as Beth said in a sermon not too long ago, it's what Jesus Christ demands. Mm -hmm. right. One no. more. Oh. Anybody particularly want to just do? pick a victim? Yeah, do Destiny. Destiny. Destiny's had her Bible open. <laughs> Destiny's going to get yeah. me. Random passage. Here we go. Um, so this is on page 725, um, Jeremiah, and chapter 23 is what I opened on. So uh, it says, Restoration After Exile. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who... Sh yeah, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and you have driven them away and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Yeah. All right, we're gonna First. stop there. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, my mind immediately goes to the responsibilities of leadership in the church that um, the sheep of God's pasture are God's children, and those who scatter them, those who, you know, we all know very public stories of um, pastors who have led double lives or other kinds of leaders who have led double lives. The Catholic Church has had lots of exposés of some of the double lives and the the harm done to God's people. And I think what this is basically saying is, God's not messing around with that. God cares very much that, um, I don't think God expects leaders to be perfect at all, but I think God certainly expects kind of the basics of integrity. Um, you know, doing what's right, whether anyone's looking or not. And that, you know, I'm, nobody does that perfectly, but when you start harming other people by doing that imperfectly, then I think God takes that very, very seriously. 
Um, and, and on that happy note, uh, <laughs> you know, that's why we take vows when we, um, when we be or become ordained as elders or uh, teaching elders or ruling elders in the church. That we say we're going to do this with energy, imagination, intelligence, and love. We're going to do it with integrity. We're going to lead, not perfectly, but to the best of our abilities, faithfully. And um, I mean, who of us does not have a story about a church ripped apart by someone in leadership who chose their own gratification or financial gain, et cetera, et cetera, over that of their church? Um, any questions? And that's very dark, sorry. <laughs> Destiny chose it. She didn't choose it. It chose it chose destiny. If you were, go ahead. So this makes me think of the whole Hillsong yeah. uh, situation. Um, and as I was watching that documentary, I was hoping people would realize it wouldn't negate the experience that people had in feeling closer to God just because of the discretions of that one leader. Um, and I know in that case, it did turn a lot of people away, but boy, it brought a lot of people to God. And so I hope that continues to, um, I hope that Satan doesn't come through and take those people away. Um, they felt misled, but um, God is there for us all to mm -hmm. love us and welcome us to the table. And I'm, I'm grateful to be in a church, in a denomination, where I don't have the kind of pressure put on me that a place like Hillsong puts on their leadership. Hillsong is, um, do you have, any of you don't know what Hillsong? Hillsong is um, a uh, evangelical mega church, branches all over, and then found there was corruption at the top, you know, it's the same song we hear over and over again. I'm grateful, you know, when I worked for the Southern Baptist as a therapist, I was really concerned if I had a glass of wine out in public. With y'all, I just don't care. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. I probably have had wine with a lot of you. And, you know, and that's just an example that the joy and the blessing of being with people who know my feet are made of clay, your feet are made of clay, we're just doing the best we can, all of us. And, and I think when, when you get into high pressure situations where you have to look a certain way and behave a certain way and if your children ever step out of line, it's your fault and your failure as a, as a Christian, you know, nobody can live up to that kind of pressure. And I'm grateful to be in a place where nobody asks me to.
please be seated. I want to invite you, as we do each week, to look out to your next week, what's planned, what's coming, and look for opportunities to get up to holy mischief with God, to be surprisingly loving, surprisingly generous, surprisingly helpful to someone, so that just a little bit of God light can come through around you this week. Let's pray. God, these plans, this offering, is what we have to give you this day. Be it our time, our generosity of kindness or help, sharing a talent or financial giving, we lift these gifts to you. It is through you that all things are made new, and we ask that you renew our spirit to continue sharing our gifts with the least of us. Amen. Please rise for the doxology. I believe the battery has died on me. Yep, I think so. Well, we will carry on this way. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Okay, I'll talk right into it. So we've come to the time when we can be the family of God and extend our care. Um, I would bring you a prayer request. Um, I've mentioned our sister-in-law, Mark and I, Mark's brother's wife. Um, she had a bunch of um, a AFib incidents, and so they took her, put her in the hospital early, um, and had the procedure Friday, was it? Friday, and that was successful, but she will still have open heart surgery sometime this week. So she is one who does not have a church community. So we can lift her up from a state away in prayer. Are there others? If I can add the uh, surgery is scheduled for Tuesday, I believe at 8 a.m. And then, or 7 a.m. Then uh, also prayers uh, lifted for Beth and me as we go and help relocate her family, her parents from uh, Florida up here to Nashville that we're going to be uh, gone Monday through Friday doing that and then an offer of praise and that I have taken a new job I'm very excited about and it will begin September the 1st and uh, it'll be with a, a statewide association of clinics that serve the poor and so this is uh, a place I worked at many years ago. I cut my teeth in working there on uh, working with uh, helping them develop the ability to serve low-income, underserved communities. And so I'm excited to go back. And I'm excited because he'll probably live longer. <laughs> Are there other prayer requests? Thank you. Um, so I... I work for a homelessness prevention initiative, and as part of that, we work with people who have experienced homelessness in the past who help us figure out how to make the system better. Um, and I got a phone call from one of those women the other day whose uh, sister is escaping domestic violence in Atlanta and is currently also in a manic episode and just gave birth about two days ago. 
So there's social services involved. Uh, she is currently homeless. Um, and, you know, so just, um, yeah, keep her, keep her in your prayers. Someone I've been thinking about a lot. Sure. I do not know her name. Um, but, you know, this, the, the former client is someone who, like, I've had a relationship with over the years, um, or over the last couple of years. Her name's Kristen. So Kristen's sister um, is who we're thinking about. So, um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot going on. And, uh, you know, and it's also hard because if she gives up her kid to social services, um, it's harder for her to get housing. Um, but if she doesn't, the kid is potentially not in a safe place. So, you know, just a really bad situation all the way around. Yeah. Any others? I'd like to ask for traveling mercies for Lauren and Mike as they go back to New York. Also would like to say prayers for um, people struggling in relationships for instance, sisters <laughs> and mothers and daughters. And, um, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we have to just accept people the way they are and not try to change them and love them for who, who they are and what they bring to us already. Let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the gift of another day for sunshine and clouds, long summer days, for shade and for sunblock. We lift up our hearts to give thanks for changing seasons through the sweetness of cold drinks and days gradually getting shorter. We give thanks for ordinary neighbors who use their gifts and talents to help others, for farmers, merchants, bakers, and others who help provide our loved ones and ourselves with nourishment. We give thanks for the everyday miracles that give us hope, such as plants growing, yeast raising bread. God of grace and peace, we offer our prayers for those in need. In this moment of prayer, we pause to remember those who don't have the resources they need. Those who are lonely, without community. Those who cannot find peace in their body or mind those who struggle with religious trauma. And, oh God, we pause to remember those whose names have been lifted up in love this morning. We pray for Cherie, that as she faces open-heart surgery, she would have peace that passes understanding, and we pray for successful surgery. Lord, we lift up Kristen's sister, that you would surround her with resources and love and people who understand. We ask your um, traveling mercies for Lauren and Mike, for Mark and I as we travel this week, and for all people who struggle in relationships, which is all of us at some time or another. We ask that you would give us grace to accept one another as we are. Oh God, you welcome us into the kingdom of heaven. It is a kingdom that is beyond our understanding, but we trust that you know it just as you know us. God, let us find peace in that which we cannot know and faith to trust in your love. Finally, hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn.
God know this. The Lord goes with you. The Lord is risen. So go out into all this world and fear nothing. Amen. <laughs>